All right, I'm going to I'm going to begin now with our introductions, and more people will be coming in. And I think that uh, over the course of our time today, people will be coming in and out. But let me first uh, introduce myself. That I am um, Seth Lehrer, and I am in the literature department at the University of California at San Diego. I came here now a dozen years ago as Dean of Arts and Humanities, and now I'm full-time in the literature department. And this year, it's been my privilege and honor to have been appointed as the director of both the program in classical studies and the Center for Hellenic Studies. And among the things that I am hoping to do is not just bring these programs together, but to reach out to students, to faculty and members of the community through this lecture series that we're inaugurating today. To think about ways in which the classics, the study of the ancient world, the study of the Greek and Roman world, how these contribute to conversations about the place of the humanities today. How the question of scholarship or graduate work in classical studies, but also the place of the study of the past in our lived present really matters. And I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Neuter today from the University of Chicago, who will be inaugurating this lecture series. Let me say a few things about Professor Neuter. In many ways, she's one of America's leading classicists. She specializes in Greek drama and poetry. She has been the editor of Classical Philology, one of the leading journals really in the world, where she played a vital role in shaping uh, publications in literary and philological and historical work in classics. She has been an active and influential member of the University of Chicago Classics Department and of the University of Chicago as a whole. And I think she is also someone who is very valuable for us to listen to today because she herself has done a great deal of outreach. I am particularly impressed by her web presence and by the posts that she has under the Sybil's Cave, Advice for Scholars in Antiquity. I think this is a great place for anyone interested in going to graduate school, being an undergraduate in the field, for scholars at all levels. And she really focuses in so many ways on what she's calling today strategies of survival and the place of the classics and the humanities in the landscapes for academic life. Let me say a few logistical things. Um, uh, Sarah will have a PowerPoint presentation. She's going to uh, talk to us for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then I hope we'll have at least about a half an hour for discussion and Q&A. We will be recording this event today and uh, it will be made available. And I just also want to say that uh, Sarah will be inaugurating this lecture series in two weeks. We'll be hosting Edith Hall from London. And then in the spring, um, Paige, our own Paige Dubois has generously agreed to talk with us and uh, Andromache Karanika from the University of California, Irvine will be talking to us as well uh, during the spring quarter. I want to thank in particular, Anna Marie uh, Bienviaje, who is our uh, master of all things technical here, a wonderful administrator. I want to thank Catherine Levy and Jennifer Gelly in the Dean's office for making it so smooth for me to transition into the directorships of classical studies and Hellenic studies. And I want to especially thank many members of our Hellenic community, some of whom are on today, for their welcome and for their support. And so um, what I'm going to do is, uh, do we need, Anna Marie, is there any more housekeeping or logistical issues that I need to raise? Then at this point, I'm going to say welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, one thing I do want to say is that when we do get to Q&A, I'd like to do it through the chat function so that you can post your questions on chat <clears throat> and then I will moderate the discussion from there. So I am now going to mute myself and I'm going to invite Sarah to uh, begin her presentation. Sarah, welcome so much virtually to sunny Southern California. Thank you, Seth. That was 
That was a way too generous introduction. Um, and I, I was before people came on. I was um, I was expressing my envy of all you in California. We have a, another another blizzard, second blizzard of the week over here in Chicago. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking to you, even if I'm not in in person. Um, so I I uh, haven't really given a talk of this nature before, despite. Um, Seth's uh, very high praise about sort of public outfacing activity. I'm uh, I'm a little terrified of a lot of the online world. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't I don't do Facebook, um, and I think a lot about classics. But I've never yet given a talk about sort of classics. So um, so I'm looking forward to what you guys think and and what the actual conversation after the talk will look like. I want to just say that as many of you probably know. Um, an article was published two days ago in the New York Times online. Um, so I, I actually finished writing this talk a week ago. Um, and, then, and this article came out on um, Daniel uh, Padilla Peralta. And he, so he's a professor at Princeton. And the article is really about him and his relationship to classics uh, and sort of ideas about the future of the field. It's very relevant in a way to, to what I'm talking about, but I didn't have a chance to respond to it in my talk. Um, however, I'm really open to talking about it during the discussion period, so please feel free to bring it up if you like. Uh, so I will share my screen and then I will begin the talk. Um, so. All right, so does that look okay? Okay. So when I'm feeling down about the much lamented state of the humanities in the world today, I try to remind myself of what a miracle it is that the humanities exist as such at all. I was invited today to discuss classics, but already I've turned instead to humanities. And that's because in many ways, the problems and potentials of the classics are also those that attend on the humanities. And yet, and but, in important ways, they differ. I wanna spend a few minutes today on the history of the humanities and classical education with a focus on the particular words we use for these pursuits before I turn to potential futures for this thing we call classics and the people who do it. So as Seth said, I'll, I expect to talk for about 30 minutes. So before we get to the problems, let me just say something about the miracle of the humanities, which is rooted, I think, in the miracle that is literature. Walter Ong writes of the deeply oral nature of language generally and backs up his position with numbers that I'm going to quote here. Indeed, language is so overwhelmingly oral that of all the many thousands of languages, possibly tens of thousands, spoken in the course of human history, only around 106 have ever been committed to writing to a degree sufficient to have produced literature, and most have never been written at all. So Ahn goes on to write of writing as, co as a commitment of word to space, which enlarges the potentiality of language beyond measure. And yet the spoken word is nonetheless what maintains the breathing living presence of language. Fascinating as this topic is, it is not the subject of my talk today. But I start here because the numbers on quotes remind me that the written, that written literature is itself not an inevitability. Humans can get by without it. The fact that only 106 or so out of thousands of languages have produced written language and that we live in a time when it seems worthwhile to maintain our study of that work is itself a kind of wondrous phenomenon. I think that literature itself, old fashioned as even that word sounds, has endless resources on offer for people at all stages and crises of their lives. Literature is a preserved form of a deeply thought through conversation among humans over many generations. We humanists, particularly us classicists, support the preservation of this slow motion conversation, which happens of course, not just in literature, but also in art, film, music, dance, and a variety of other media. We serve the existence of these interchanges. We maintain their place in the world, even as the world often needs convincing that they are worthy of any place at all. Indeed, when newspapers like the New York Times pay attention to the humanities as such, it is usually to decry their downfall. So for example, in January of 2020, Ross Dotat, I think that's how you pronounce the name, warned of an, an academic apocalypse and quoted from a recent issue of the Chronicle Review, which informs us that the academic study of literature is no longer on the verge of collapse, it is in the midst of it. 
This particular issue also features articles called Losing Faith in the Humanities and the New Humanities. Arguments here range from the idea that the humanities are undergoing a second form of secularization, separating them from popular cultural expressions of literature and art, to the view that traditional humanities are being stripped for spare parts in order to build sexy stemish versions of them, such as environmental humanities and of course, digital humanities. The apparent collapse of the humanities is also tied and rightly so to a much larger problem that I will only gesture at today the collapse of living wage professorial positions so, so, uh, here we are. via the ever more widespread replacement of tenure stream jobs with low paying benefits lacking adjunct positions. So if you just want to glance at the slide, um, you'll see the, the blue and the green bars represent tenure and tenure track positions and, and those are getting lower through the years and the yellow and the orange bars represent um, non-tenure stream positions and those you see are getting higher as we go. Um, so I don't have answers for these problems and they're much wider and larger than what I can cover today, uh, but I acknowledge them as a real form of the devaluation of education that is now afoot. The world is asking to have its humanities cheaper, if at all. So then the narrative of the humanities in collapse or is reaching the apocalypse presumes that things were better or more stable before we came to this perilous state. We are to imagine a world in which the humanities sauntered through fields and forests, appreciated and adored, thriving and endowing faculty and students alike with flourishing paths to gainful employment and enlightenment. It was all fine until the Reaganomics or the end of the Cold War or the financial crisis of 2008. But here's a question. How did the study of poetry, fiction, and language acquire its position in the first place? And how did we get the fantastic name humanities? I have always appreciated this personally, belonging to the field that roughly means human things or human stuff. I used to think of the name the human stuff as being in opposition to disciplines that study stuff in the world, like geology or cosmology, the inhuman stuff. But of course, this dichotomy breaks down fast when one contemplates many fields such as biology, chemistry, or economics. Isn't it all on some level human stuff? The answer historically speaking is yes. In its earliest usages, the term humanities indicated the study of things that were not objects of theology, which is to say things that were not considered divine. One example from the late 15th century for, refers to the, the double science, that is to say divinity and humanity. Another early reference to humanities, this one from the late 16th century, gives us profane literature and humanite opposite unto sacred letters. As science came to take its place as something separate that pertained to the natural world, of which we, it turns out, are not a part, three categories formed, as Francis Bacon writes in 1605. He says, uh, there do arise three knowledges, divine philosophy, natural philosophy, and human philosophy, or humanity. So in origin, the term humanities, meaning human stuff, was created to designate the non-human stuff. And only after that did something like the non-human, non-divine stuff come to be formulated. And if you really want to consider academic collapse, um, you can go looking for divinity studies, um, which exist still, but not, not at the power that, it, of course, it once had. But what does all of this etymological history have to do with classics? Well, everything, of course, because the term humanities, which previously was called the singular and somewhat more potent humanity, in fact, specifically designated what we now call classics, and even more specifically, the study of Latin. Here are a couple of examples, and you can see that we're zooming forward now to the 19th century. Lectures in humanity, that is, in classical literature, were in 1535 established in all colleges of the University of Oxford. And then again, Latin, not altogether without reason called humanity in this university, is the greatest of all keys to the history of the thoughts and the mind itself of civilized man. By the 20th century, Greek had joined Latin definitively in the high tower of literae humaniores, which is what the classics undergraduate major is still called at Oxford. This phrase, of course, doesn't just mean human letters, but more human letters, showing some blurring of the stuff between the human and divine. So, English and then American colleges first were in the business of teaching theology, the divine stuff or res divinii to young men aspiring towards ministries. Along the way, classics, first meaning Latin only, 
gained enough cachet to be included in the realm of formalized study with the so-called profane languages, which is to say modern languages, following uh, not till much later. And speaking of cachet, where did the name classics come from anyway? That name that requires one to distinguish eternally between the study of Greek and the Greek and Roman world and the study of all literature deemed canonical, like you know, the novels of Jane Austen. This name that helps give the field its ancient sheen of canonical holier than thouness. Many of you probably already know the answer to this. Classics comes right from the Latin classicus, uh, where it indeed denotes high status. It is only ever once used in the so-called classical period to refer to distinguished authorship. And this is in the second century CE by Aulus Gellius, quoting Fronto, in order to distinguish between any superior or first rate author and a low class or literally proletarius writer. So the connotation of class itself, status, distinction, even separateness is baked into the word classics from its classical start. It is surely this aura of high status that is at least partly responsible for its addition to curricula otherwise concerned with theology in the first place. And this is to say nothing of its use in textual criticism, the fine art of deciphering manuscript traditions that rose up for no less serious a task than the deciphering of the Holy Bible itself. And so the classics, AKA the human stuff was born and became eventually the gateway drug to the study of other literatures, even those that are modern and vernacular and thus vulgar and profane. If we move our story more specifically to America and look at the early settings of literary study, we find their classical education understood as a stiff absorption and regurgitation of grammatical and philological particulars. Gerald Graff's professing literature and in institutional history reports that in the early 19th century, the standard college curriculum consisted in two to four years of Greek and Latin plus mathematics, history, logic, theology, and a bit of natural science in the last two years. English and other modern languages were offered more or less as electives in the final two years. So here's where the story of humanities at large and the story of classics in particular diverges sharply. Graf's text tells a story that we all know in some form. English and other foreign languages start to gain ground after the Civil War and then still more substantially in the early 20th century and particularly after World War II. Classics then had its strongest heyday when the world of college education was largely also concerned with matters of theology and moral philosophy in general. Classical study itself was not literary so much as grammatical and philological based in rote learning and not interpretation. The self-discipline required to go through the motions of mastering classical languages with thought to transmute somehow into the self-discipline needed for the pursuit of a moral and rigorously Christian life. It goes without saying that this world was very male and very white. So that's the past, our past, and it's not that far behind us. Our feeling that the field is shrinking of regret over this loss is also on some level regret for the loss of a deeply Christian and limiting view of what both humanities and the classics had to offer. Some of the implicit ideals tucked within the early 19th century curricula are clearly still with us. Classicists today still cling to a position that the rigor of learning the ancient language, languages selects and reveals the strong and weeds out the weak. Thus, the so-called qualifying exams in the translation of Greek and Latin texts that still tend to play the role of gatekeeper to the field. My own path to classics is clearly rooted in this history too. I went to a small liberal private school in Brooklyn for my K to 12 years, and there's a picture. Where we were all required to take Latin starting in sixth grade and strongly encouraged to continue doing so at least until high school. I hated Latin for three long years, and I did not understand why I was being compelled to absorb arcane lists of minuscule bits of knowledge, paradigms and endings, and something vague and complex called the subjunctive that seemed to equate to nothing at all. It somehow was never clearly explained to me what was waiting on the other side, and so I thought there was no other side. I imagined Latin as the endless memorizing of arcane syntactical forms all the way down. It was only in the beginning of high school that we started to read poetic texts, and this was a shocking and welcome shift, a pure revelation of a new activity that I had not known existed, poetic translation. I learned that I love translating Latin poetry, 
but also that I had to relearn all of that arcane knowledge of Indians and such now that I valued it and knew what it was for. I picked up ancient Greek thereafter and the rest for me is history. I'd like to say that I've been doing my job since I was 12. This all worked out happily enough for me if you consider becoming a classicist a happy fate, but this path nevertheless depends on worn tropes of education via the enforcement of obedient memorization as a kind of imposition of moral rigor. Whether this works for some or not, it is surely not in keeping with contemporary movements and realities of education to expect such practice to be at its heart, at least not in America. Moreover, the framing of Latin as a central prerequisite to all other language learning, whether a wise idea or no, is no longer an element of elementary education writ large. So the path that got me here won't really work for the next generation. And we classicists should not imagine that it will ever again when we consider on ramps to classics and picture the future of our field. So let's discuss that future. Here again, we will find important similarities and differences between the humanities in general and classics in particular. Although humanities was once equated with Latin and Greek to a lesser extent, its identity and fortunes are now far more aligned with English departments, the locus for many a culture war. Classics is a different role to play these days, one that comes with unique advantages, burdens, and responsibilities. The singular position arises from its longstanding, if often implicit, claim to offer as its subject matter the root and bounty of so-called Western civilization. So what is Western civilization? Well, it's a phrase that's gone out of fashion in liberal academic circles, but that we all still have sitting in the middle of our consciousness. The Wikipedia definition of Western civilization begins as follows. It is the her heritage of social norms, ethical values, traditional customs, belief systems, political systems, artifacts and technologies of the Western world that originated in or are associated with Europe. The following paragraphs start with the assertion that uh, ancient Greece is considered the birthplace of many elements of Western culture. Uh, Rome is name checked in the third sentence of this paragraph after which we learn that Western in the phrase Western civilization dates back to the Roman Empire where there was a cultural divide between the Greek East and Latin West, a divide that later continued into medieval Europe. So as often, our modern sense of what is important from the so-called classical world was defined by this world itself. That is, we tend to take the Greek and Roman authors at their word, and their word has been transmitted faithfully right through scholars of the 19th century, like Hegel and to today. Supplying the origin of all European and European associated culture, arts, thought, and technology is a pretty big claim to fame for classics. The problem is that Western civilization has been revealed many times, in fact, as a conveniently white fantasy of cultural invention, as to take one example, an article in The Guardian in 2016 by Kwame Anthony Apia proclaims in its title, there is no such thing as Western civilization. As Apia demonstrates, um, the definition of what counts as West or Western has changed conveniently over the last couple of centuries. So uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, I'll just kind of sum it up, but here it's posted. For Kipling, as for the Greeks, the non-West was Asia. During the Cold War, the non-West was the other side of the Iron, Iron Curtain. In other words, the identity of the other has changed. And as it has, so too has that of the West. These days, the West more or less means the Northern Atlantic, Europe, North America, and of course, the paler parts of the Southern Hemisphere too, like Australia. So does Western mean Christian and European or just white? So by now you're probably thinking that my point is to wag my finger at you about how racist the ideas of Western civilization and classics are, as well as probably humanities, academics, and everything you've ever engaged in. However, ultimately I'd like to make a different point. It is rather and simply that we should embrace this debate about what our inherent inheritances are and ride our embrace of this debate into the next generation of the humanities and of classics. But let us return to the question of words for a moment. I have spent a lot of my time here picking apart terms like humanities and classics and Western civilization, because I think that it matters what things get called, even after we've forgotten why they get called that in the first place. Words carry around with them origins and histories, complexities and nuances, internal contradictions and jokes. Even more interesting than the origins of words are their stories of change, and the anxiety and ambition that these tales reveal. 
The ways that words and their meanings change show something that I find encouraging about both humans and language. That is how hard we are trying to get words and their meanings to match in a way that feels both right and real. To take a loaded example, Henry Louis Gates Jr. has said that he began his personal college application SATL with the line, my grandfather was colored, my father was Negro and I am black. Gates wrote about this essay in his 1994 memoir called Colored People. The 1990s was a time during which the label African-American rose to prominence. In reference to it, Gates wrote a message in a book's preface, which was addressed to his two daughters. In your lifetimes, I suspect, you will go from being African-Americans to people of color, to being once again colored people. The linguistic trend towards condensation is strong. Condensation is strong. I don't mind any of the names myself, but I have to confess that I like colored best, maybe because when I hear the word, I hear it in my mother's voice and in the sepia tones of my childhood. It has been 27 years since Gates published these sentences. It does not look yet like we are returning to the phrase colored people, although BIPOC is not far off. And he is right on the money about the condensation of language, witness our return from African-American to black, but now with the difference of the uppercase B, a twist that is meant to add a sense of orthographical dignity or so I understand it. I very much like the quotation from Gates and I've displayed it for you because of its quiet revelation of the range of connotations, even denotations in the word color, which are brought to the fore by Gates' justification for preferring the term colored. Quote, when I hear the word, this is that last sentence, I hear it in my mother's voice in the sepia tones of my childhood. This is a fantastically rich sentence, importing into a highly politicized and pejorative term colored the quality of voice, and not just any voice, but the all important mother's voice. And at the same time, synesthet synesthetically linking the sound of this voice and this word to actual visible color, sepia. Sepia, in turn, is linked through an implicit reference to the history of photography, to time and its passage, to loss and longing. In importing all of these personal meanings to the term colored, Gates at least partially exports it from its racist, nasty, and degrading origin. He revivifies the word, waking it from evil usages like a zombie resuscitated from a, an apocalyptic trance. But back to the humanities and classics. What if classics stayed classics, but we imported some of the life and meaning into it that Gates manages to do with the term colored? I believe that this is a live question because one of the current trends in the world of classics these days is that of the face-saving name change. Indeed, I can readily point to four cases of name changes or would-be name changes in classics uh, inflected titles. So I'm gonna run through them quickly now as examples of what I'm talking about. Two of these name changes pertain to departments that were previously departments of classics or classical studies. One is now called the Department of Ancient Mediterranean Studies. And the other, as I understand the situation from a colleague, is seeking permission from the administration to become the Department of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies. The third change is widely known and was much lamented when it was made several years back. This is the transformation of the American Philological Association to the Society for Classical Studies. So this one, of course, adds the word classics. Finally, the fourth name change did not happen, but was floated and rejected. So this was a change of the name of the journal that I edit on leave right now, but that I usually edit, um, classical philology, to something that would presumably have been less philological, but still classical. In at least three out of these four cases, the question of whether to change the name was heavily contested, emotional and combative. And I don't know enough about what went on behind the scenes of the fourth case to say. Um, as Henry Gates's commentary on racial terms demonstrates, names accrue politics, sentiment, memories, and associative heft. Changing them, blotting out one for another can feel violent and dismissive, even when the replaced terms themselves are violent and dismissive. The changes of the two departmental titles, the one to uh, ancient Mediterranean studies and one to ancient Greek and Roman studies, interestingly point in almost opposite directions. The title Ancient Greek and Roman Studies downshifts to a presumably literal account of what sort of courses and research is offered by that department. 
without the sheen, fanfare, or cultural burdens of the name classics. The classics department becomes a simple, modest area studies department. By contrast, the title Ancient Mediterranean Studies implicitly promises to cease from treating Greece and Rome themselves as if they were the only cultures worthy of attention in that region of the world. And yet I should say a perusal of that website does suggest that they're still basically offering courses in Greece and Rome. Um, so how much should we as a discipline add and what should we strip away? How much should we claim? Should we adjust expectations to fit the more modest proportions of a department like German or Italian? Or should we change our actual goals, activities and expenditures to fit a wider set of understanding about our origins? So let me dwell for a moment on the name of the journal Classical Philology. So I should say that this debate took place before I was editor. So I participated in the discussion, uh, but I was not its driving force. Classical Philology, as our website tells you, is now an aged journal of 115 years. Its name, therefore, is a matter of some vintage and prestige. And yet our mission statement, uh, which I did help to craft now, um, suggests that we cover a broad range of topics, including studies that illuminate aspects of the languages, literatures, history, art, philosophy, social life, material culture, religion, and reception of ancient Greece and Rome. So for some people involved in the name discussion, the pro-name changers, the question was whether our name should reflect our updated, not entirely philological mission and contents in part to attract the sort of content we now want. Meanwhile, for the anti-name changers, the name itself was part of our history and our identity. It is sepia-toned, like the word colored for Henry, Henry Louis Gates. Even if the word had stopped functioning as a common noun, it still had power as a proper name. And isn't that all we expect of names in the first place? So to circle back to classics, should it behave like a proper name or like a descriptive label? Should it change as we change, if indeed we do? Or should it maintain its sepia tone tie to history, however problematic and exclusionary that history may turn out to be? And so here I'm sort of sidestepping the question of whether classics departments, as opposed to just the name classics, should exist at all, um, or whether they should be kind of broken into different, different departmental entities. And I know that um, at UCSD, you have a literature department. So I imagine you have a lot to say about this. <clears throat> but I'll tell you my own opinion now. My prescription for the field classics would be that we keep the name classics, but expand and adjust our relationship to the name and change the activities that persist under its flag. In doing so, I feel we will have to find creative ways to be different rather than just appearing so. And in becoming different in our projects, our projections and our membership, we can survive as a field as I very much hope we will. So I will spend the remaining few minutes of my prepared remarks outlining a few of the creative initiatives and steps forward that are already being taken and then open the floor to discussion. So a number of initiatives are indeed keeping the word classics, but modifying it with language that is meant to neutralize some of its exclusive connotations, particularly by way of words that include the word every, as in everyone, everywhere, and all. The Society for Classical Studies, for example, has been giving small grants out for several years now under the banner Classics Everywhere. Um, <clears throat> it seeks to fund projects, so here's a statement, it seeks to fund projects on classical antiquity and its legacy that reach beyond the curricula of schools, colleges, and universities and find new audiences, particularly those that are historically underrepresented in the field of classics and that have not had access to programs in classical studies. In addition to funding, the funding it provides for such projects, and that's up to $2,000 a pop, the SCS also implicitly promises publicity. They keep a running blog on their website that documents the projects they have funded, from public lectures on Martha Graham's interactions with, class, with Greek tragedy and dance, to a classical week each year at Mississippi State University, to after-school programs in Latin and Roman culture and social media projects that seek to publicize classical ideas by posting daily on antiquity in different online venues. And so my first slide, which I think is very pretty, um, it, uh, I mean, I didn't create it. It's a picture from the SCS blog about a, um, a public art project at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, and actually one of, the, one of the artists involved is a classicist at Columbia, Lakshmi um, Ramgopal, who got her PhD at Chicago. Nonetheless, uh, 
it's a representation of sort of you know, one way that kind of the classical world has been kind of reimagined for, uh, for contemporary life. So on the other side of the pond, a somewhat more centralized effort is underway to change the place of classics in secondary school education. And this is called ACE or Advocating Classics Education. And the tagline in the website reads in big letters, as you see, classical civilization and ancient history for everyone. This project spearheaded by Edith Hall, so you can ask her about it in a couple of weeks, aims to bring classics to high schoolers throughout the UK. Among the advantages it touts to learning about uh, ancient Greek and Roman civilization, history, thought, literature, art, and archaeology are not only a host of life skills, but also access to the development of, quote, identities founded in citizenship on the national, European, and cosmopolitan global level. ACE plans to bring more British children to classics in part by de-emphasizing the importance of classical languages, that is, Latin and Greek, and emphasizing instead classics as a gateway to history and culture. In Britain, most secondary school education cashes out in A-level exams. Subjects that are not tested at A-levels are not featured heavily in education to begin with. Thus, the mission statement for ACE proclaims the following. Unfortunately, qualifications at A-level in Latin and ancient Greek languages are hardly available outside the private education sector. There is, however, a financially feasible solution for state sector students the introduction of courses leading up to qualifications in classical civilization or ancient history. In most parts of the UK, these qualifications can be taught by any teacher of any subject currently employed in a school or sixth form college and in possession of qualified teacher status, enthusiasm to teach the ancient world and sufficient support. The effort to spread classics widely while also decoupling it definitively from Latin and Greek it's perhaps more revolutionary than it might at first appear. Recall that classics itself in its early form, when it was called not just classics, but humanities, was based in and justified by the philological study of Latin and Greek. To strip away this aspect from classics is to risk taking away the part that defined it in the first place. Nor is this the only effort in the UK that aims to bring classics to the people, albeit classics in a somewhat transformed form. An even more ambitious initiative called Classics for All, a not-for-profit run out of King's College London, aims to reverse a nationwide decline in classical education in both primary and secondary schools, noting that the teaching of classics has been in sharp decline in the UK since uh, the UK state schools from the 1970s. Classics for All was established to reverse this trend. The organization claims to have worked with 60,000 pupils aged seven to 18 over 940 schools, introducing them to all things classical from Latin to Homeric epic. In an essay published last year, Patrice Rankine explores the contradictions of classics for all, not the organization per se, although to some degree, yes, um, but the idea, and suggests that efforts to spread access to the classics more widely, threatens to paper over deep inequities that still persist at both racial and economic levels. And yet he notes that, quote, Black Atlantic authors time and again choose the classics as vernacular material to shape their own ethical concerns and ideas and responses to broader societal issues, and especially to reject European hegemony. Teaching classics to all, that is, to a far wider and more diverse group of people than ever before, will not save the world, despite the many promises made by prom programs that aim to spread study of the classical world. I do not think that anyone really thinks it will. The hope, rather, is to save classics. Is classics, whether in the guise of humanities, Greek and Roman studies, or the ancient Mediterranean world, worthy of saving? I have not even touched on the many terrible movements that have claimed the banner of classics, from Nazism to the mob that stormed the Capitol last month. Each of these moments is a part of our history and our identity. Each must be recognized and repudiated as well as learned from. To survive, therefore, classics must exist in a state of creative tension. We must wrestle with its elitist and troubling legacy while also suggesting that parts of the same legacy are worth preservation, that they're in fact a gift to be shared. So let us stay tuned to the new. Let us welcome comparative work and adaptations from other communities and histories, creative translation, the shaping of new poems, new plays, and new genres we have not yet thought of. 
We also as ever need a new politics or as Rankine has suggested, a new abolitionist movement to dismantle race, racial thinking and racism, as well as a broad awareness of the economic conditions in which we operate. For even in such a landscape, we must find the language to make claims for our literatures. The classics gives us a claim to offering a view of origins and transformations over time. And it gives us a glimpse too of alternative ways of living, of other paths, constructs, and outcomes. As classicists and as humanists, we need to be open about our difficult past and assertive about forging new paths into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I can think of no better introduction uh, for this series and what a wonderful general and provocative talk. And I'm so glad that, um, that you were able to lead us off in, in so many ways. Um, as we mentioned, I'd like to use the chat function to take any question or discussion points. And so if you'll post your uh, questions on the chat, I'll uh, go through them, I'll read them and I'll uh, report them to everybody and then uh, I'll ask Sarah to, to respond. So uh, the floor is really open through that. If people wanna speak in their own, you know, just speak into the camera, I'm also happy to take questions that way myself. Sure, or we could do the participant with a blue hand as well. There are many ways of making this work. Paige, you've raised your hand. Yes, um, and I wanna thank you very much, Sarah. That was really inspiring. Oh, and so informative too. And you really took on the very difficult question. So I really appreciate that. And I want to invite you, I was going to ask you about the uh, Danielle Padilla Peralta um, article before I heard you speak. And it seems so pertinent um, to what you're talking about and the kinds of issues you raised. You know, is he suggesting that we just get rid of classics, that we strip it, as you said, you know, and um, use it to talk about, um, you know, the ab abolition of white supremacy, classics as a bulwark of white supremacy. So I just, I'm curious about your reaction to it as a whole. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm still processing the piece and, and the reactions to it. I don't know if you've looked, but and the Times website now has something like 12 or 1300 comments on that piece. Um, so I, you know, I, there's a lot in that article that I essentially agree with. Um, and Danielle is an amazing person. He has an amazing life story. What he's done and what he's doing is, um, you know, it's incredibly forceful for our field, right? And it's kind of changing the way we think about it every day. Um, I mean, though, you know, he he ranges over to this fiery language of, you know, destruction of the field if we can't X, Y, and Z. So I, you know, I don't want the field to be destroyed. I, I'm not convinced that Dan L does either, actually. Um, I also, I guess I have a qualm with the piece itself, um, less than with Dan L, which is that, so I say, you know, I have, I had say at the beginning of this talk, oh, the time, when the Times talks about humanities, they talk about its downfall. And um, that article doesn't seem to notice the context of classics at all. Um, there is, as far as I recall, zero references to the fact that humanities are indeed in trouble, um, that education is in trouble, uh, that the whole way we fund education is a big mess, you know, that we, we're essentially, we're not in a good situation here. The classic departments are already being closed down. Um, I would like to have seen an article that placed this debate about classics within a wider context, because I mean, I think many people may, may um, share this fear, but I, uh, I don't think that there's a world where like you have an administration that's gonna cut, cut a classics department and then take that money and put it into a really forward thinking BIPOC literature department. I think you just have administrations that would cut classics departments. Um, I really think that, you know, classics sh should change, but also sh I would like to see it be part of a thriving world of humanities. And so, sorry, there's some. So that's where I feel like the article is just a touch unhelpful um, in, in the kind of conversations we need to have, just because it's, its focus is so, is so narrowly limited to one kind of debate. Um, but what did, what did you think, Paige? Well, I, I thought you touched on a lot of the ways in which 
the field has been self-critical and has tried to talk about yeah. being a bulwark of white supremacy and, you know, Sarah Bond and all, lots of people have been bringing up these issues. And, he, you know, there's a way in which the article is so sort of focused on this one voice. No, that's right. I mean, that's I, unfortunate, actually. A lot of the criticism that I've seen in sort of the Twitter world secondhand because um is about how the voice is quoted in the article that there aren't the other voices who are doing this work but i have to say i mean you go back now i think what three decades and there there's a lot of work on i mean your own work included on on slavery in the ancient world for example i mean they quote amy richland as the leading historian of women's studies but she also wrote a book on slavery you know so i think that there you know there's a kind of creative framing to suggest we have a lone voice no, that's not correct. Um, but I imagine there's almost always that kind of framing and in, in, uh, in yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Thank you for both of that. Uh, I have three blue hands and I have a chat. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to uh, run through the blue hands in order. Uh, that's my colleague Jacopo Meyerston and my colleague Vera Balberg and uh, Zantippi Markenskoff. Uh, uh, Jacopo, would you like to lead off, please? Yeah. Um, just make sure that you can hear me. Um, so um, Chicago has one pioneer program in the studies of the ancient world, right? So which is kind of like a, is uh, was moved into classics uh, when I was there. And uh, this program has produced um, many books that had a, a huge impact in a kind of new emerging field of um, ancient Mediterranean studies, um, it's not just that it was a change of name, is uh, that name was there because um, um, the ancient world was being studied from a different perspective, not limiting um, the ancient world um, to Greek and Latin. Um, I wonder if you could um, um, yeah, um, address that issue of um, that program in Chicago and uh, the future for these kind of programs and not as a renaming of a field because it has to survive, but names that um, are invented because um, like sociology and anthropology and so on, they actually reflect a um, empirical problem, which is that the ancient world was not Greece and Rome. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Um, so the, um, Mako is, is our Chicago graduate, is referring to the fact that um, there's a bit of a history here. Chicago has departments, but they also have had in the past committees. Um, and committees were, weren't to some extent are meant to be interdisciplinary um, conglomerates of uh, people from different departments who come together in a kind of new formation that is not, not quite a department. Um, so the thing that Yag was talking about is the Committee on the um, Ancient Mediterranean World. And he's absolutely right that it's not, it's not a renamed classics department because we continue to have the classics department. Um, but it's, it exists in a form that is, was, po was, is possible at Chicago, you know, not to be chauvinist, but because we're very, we are very pro-interdisciplinary and we do try to come up with ways of thinking together and kind of changing the shapes and the forms that we have. And um, that said, I think about 15 years ago, the committees were kind of, were swept away. Um, and the Committee on the Ancient Mediterranean World became the program on the Ancient Mediterranean World and was absorbed into the Classics Department and became one of the tracks that a classicist, a, a PhD student could choose um, as he or she sort of went forward. Um, so I don't, you know, that's, that gives it a, an interesting twist to that point. I think you can either say, and some said, well, at that point it became a small thing. It became just a kind of you know, a, a sort of formulation of doing history in classics um, because it pushed away a lot of the interdisciplinarity that we used to have. Or you could say that it in, in essence kind of changed our definition in the department of what classics is. Um, and so I think, you know, people have made both kinds of arguments and the classics department is still in transformation, right? We still have, even at this moment, our whole graduate program has been a bit rewritten. Um, so, but I mean, to take your question more generally, and there are absolutely people doing really important work to show that Greece and Rome were in fact not isolated from the rest of the Mediterranean and that getting a broader picture of that entire world is, is incredibly important. And, and so, yes, it doesn't just have to be a name change, um, absolutely. 
Thank you. We have a, a whole lineup. I'm going to call on Zantippi now. Zantippi, did you unmute? I'm a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at UCSD. So I will bring a little bit different perspective, but I think uh, there are common issues uh, about the fundamentals of education. For instance, uh, in engineering, uh, the trend is less and less education in mathematics. So in a way, the students are learn uh, are, don't cannot uh, differentiate between what con what cons what consists a proof and does not consist a proof is more utilitarian mm. you know just uh, uh, apply a formula so there is no education that is uh, really uh, it is more training rather than learning how to think yeah. so i think this is happening for anything that is difficult or useless or and so on. So of course, also in engineering, there used to be in the curriculum some courses in the humanities. Now it is just considered waste of time by anybody, faculty, students. It is just a world of, uh, uh, you know, robots, so to speak. <laughs> So I think that um, now I want to make a, a minor comment about the names of the departments, like, uh, for instance, in engineering, MIT is keeping the, the traditional names of 100 years ago, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and all the new disciplines, uh, electrical, robotics, none of these are part of the, the classical names. You don't create a new name when something comes up and then something else does. So keeping the name does not uh, really imply that, uh, you know, you don't have novel thinking in the areas. So these are two different things. So these are the comments that I wanted to make. Thank you, Zantipi. I so, really did you want to respond to that at all? I'll just respond quickly to say I, I really appreciate your being at this talk and also making that comment. I think in, in humanities we're so used to envying the STEM fields that I, f I can forget that you have many of the same the same issues in some ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mira, is your hand still up? Would you uh, are you going to pay? Would you like to ask a question? I if if there's time, yes. We, we have a whole lineup, and I'm okay. not going anywhere. I don't think, I think many of us will be perfectly happy to stick around. All right, thank you. Thank you for this really beautifully done talk. Um, I want to kind of reiterate Jacobo's question, but maybe a little bit more forcefully. And, uh, and that is really the question of, rather than getting rid of classics, expanding what it means. And here I want to touch on the issue of languages, because you did mention that the whole like, well, maybe questioning the absolute necessity and indispensability of Greek and Latin is a big revolution, I agree. And I would also ask, what about other languages? Because the rigor and the discipline and the creativity that has to do with that kind of philological exploration of an ancient language is not limited to Greek and Latin, Sanskrit and Hebrew sure. and in classical Chinese and all those questions are also things that are falling out of favor. They're part of that general trend of the humanities that you absolutely described. And I'm wondering whether the path to you know, salvation, we could use that phrase, is to bring more participants in because you know, people working on Akkadian and people working on Sanskrit are also you know, in danger of extinction. Yes. And if we're thinking perhaps of the study of the ancient world as something that needs to, you know, um, that we feel needs to be salvaged, which I definitely think, perhaps the direction is actually to unite forces. So that is the first thing I, I want to ask. And also, this is just my comment. I think we need to get rid of the name classics yesterday. So <laughs> this, I understand, is, you know, um, uh, we're totally allowed to disagree with that. And, and obviously, this is a matter of disagreement. But I will say that I think that the name that you give the field is not the same as a group of marginalized people gives itself. People as, you know, whatever their, um, you know, ethnic or um, racialized identities are, can choose 
their designation. How you name a department, how you name a program is an institutional decision and it makes institutional signals. So I think that's a little yeah. bit different. So I think bit. they're wonderful comments. I'm, I'm gonna just step out away to turn the light on. I see it's getting very dark. Hold on one second, I'm sorry. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so yes, um, those were two big points. Um, so I'll just, I, I guess we don't have a ton of time. I'll try to just say something about them both. Um, I, yeah, we had, another thing about Chicago is that we have a very wonderful program in many of the ancient languages you, you need. They're actually split into a couple of programs, but yes, Sanskrit, Akkadian. Um, and I am, you know, whether, well, I, I see two issues here. One question is, would it be better if we had one department and we all combined forces so that we had the same department housing Greek studies as well as Akkadian as well? Um, and then a second question I think is how that responds to the larger question of what I'm thinking of as the on-ramp to classics. Um, so I think that does not help us with the on-ramp to classics very much at all. And that to me is the bigger problem. Um, the same public schools that are not teaching Greek um, and are teaching Latin less and less or not teaching Akkadian either. Um, so there's the, you know, that's still a question that I think is too small. Um, as for combining everything into a big department, I, I don't, I tend to, I mean, actually we have a, there's a kind of similar argument made here at the university and um, about, so it, it, again, at Chicago, we have divisions. We have a humanities division separate from the social science division. Um, we are not organized as many schools are into a school of arts and sciences. Um, and so some people see us as being, that, that makes the humanities weak because we're separate and we're, you know, we're broken apart and we're little. Um, I have tended to feel that kind of as long, there's something, there's some strength in being identified as such, even if you're weak. Um, I kind of think, that um, so at Chicago we have the near we have Near Eastern languages and literature and cultures as one department, Southeast Asian languages is another department, classics is another department. I kind of think that um, ha kind of being separate gives us identities. That is it's a luxury that most universities do not. I know, have. I know, but you know, I mean, and so so there are always all these levels on which you have to think of these questions, right? That's where I think again that these are. This is a great conversation to have. It's not going to help us get kids into classics or diversify the field, but yeah, and so yeah, I take your point. I mean, this would be a much longer conversation. I mean, you know, in a in a different venue, I'd want to talk much more about the name classics, but I also want to say that I understood that. I don't mean to su over suggest an analogy between Gates's relationship to the word color, but just to talk about the way, um, the sort of attachment and way words change and sort of gather meaning and you know the way we think about those kinds of histories. But yeah, no, no, in many ways, it's a very different kind of example. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Barno has been very patient. Jeff? Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yeah. You are unmuted. Great. Uh, I have a couple of things. There's a co concentric circles of concern here. Uh, language is very important. Um, my wife uh, was teaching German at USC. Uh, she died while she was retiring, and they retired the department at the same time. Jeez. So German disappeared. Yeah. On the other hand, I, was, I just had a very nice conversation with a friend of mine at Bucknell, who was really happy because nine students signed up for her advanced Greek course. Now, Bucknell, that's not Chicago. Yeah. And yet, uh, and she's from the University of Texas as I sort of am also. Um, she, she's got three students who are really into it. And that's how it's gonna happen. I mean, I think it's important to fight back and whenever, however yep. we can. Uh, and anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, Chicago and Columbia, the Western civilization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the Greeks. It was the Jews and the Greeks. Yeah. And so it's a lar much larger thing. And I've now become very invested in archaeology. Um, that's true of the Bucknell connection, but also in Israel. And it's, for me, it's just, it's, there's a continuous um, weave there. And, it, you know, I don't, I'm not a great fan of Black Athena, but uh, classics, so-called, has been expanding from within for a long time. Yeah. ML West, that kind of thing. So um, I think it's important to work on the front of Western Civ. Uh, I taught a course for many years at the University of Texas 
which was called world literature. And that was not a good idea. <laughs> eventually, uh, people came up with the idea that there was a world literature. Oh, right? just like one. Oh, my heavens. And I couldn't get them to change the name of my course. So I was competing with colleagues who were teaching another version of the same course, which was quite, quite different. Um, the Jews and Greeks is a very interesting topic. And I actually had, um, these were large classes, so I had TAs, and I convinced them to give a seminar to my TAs in the history of um, world Western Civ, basically. There are lots of interesting books out there. It's, it's a fascinating topic. Yes, it is. Um, From Plato to NATO is one I might recommend. David mm -hmm. Denby's great books. And for instance, the, the, the Gauls. They, you know, people would cite Montesquieu and the, um, the, the true democracy of Europe that came out of the, the woods. That kind of thing. So I think, I think that we have to fight on every front. <laughs> and I, and I, I would also say that philology is a word that nobody understands anymore. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I, if it means anything, it means something very different now, I would right, say, right. than it used to mean. Um, I, I completely agree. I actually, you know, we have, we do, as you said, have these Western, uh, we have core courses at Chicago. And I started a new one um, a few years ago with a bunch of colleagues that we call Poetry and the Human, mm -hmm. the Actual Path. Um, it is obviously, it's not a classicist uh, core. We have one of those too, actually. But, you know, because I started it um, and I get to put in what I want, more or less, I, you know, put in, I put, there's Homer. We spend a couple of weeks on book 24 of the Iliad and then following the path through more contemporary work, um, but Chapman and Pope and then and then Alice Oswald and so on. And we have a couple of weeks on lyric that follows a path from Sappho through Catullus, through Frank Bedard, through, um, and then we have um, many other cultures. We have Mayan poetry, we have indigenous American poetry uh, from the last 50 years. We have, our second quarter is very much invested in, in sort of stories of modern poetry right up to the present that deal with race and identity and, <laughs> Um, World War II, you know, just a lot of many, many different things. Um, so to me, that is, that's been really, um, really wonderful to teach. And part of what I'm trying to do kind of at a personal classes level is show classics as part of this bigger sort of beautiful story. I would never want to call it world literature. Um, it's an individualized path. No, I, it's not a, not a term I favor either. No, I know. <laughs> But I think the point is I was trying to make was that you can connect with students in all sorts of different contexts. Yes. And so, so I mean, I, I, I've written on Homer and I think Homer can appear in so many different connections. Yes. Uh, so it, it I, I mean, I'm not in academia anymore at all, not even in my mind in terms of departmental structures and whatever. And I should say that I'm going to more committee meetings now than I ever did when I was at faculty. That's before. terrible. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it voluntarily. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank Thank you. You. We have a, a couple of more. Stacy Voss has a hand, and then Monty has some chat. I'm going to ask Stacy and then Monty. Yeah, and sorry, Monty, I saw your question come in long ago, so thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Professor Neuter, for this wonderful uh, lecture. You brought up so many um, questions that I think are affecting many fields, and I'm personally a medievalist, and I've seen a lot of these kinds of questions come up in terms of what do we call the study of Old English, um, and how do we deal with questions about uh, gender and race? Um, and not so often do we hear um, as many of the points you were you were making about economics um, and the the labor pool in universities. I was really interested in the um, efforts you were showing us in um, K-12 education and your own story um, and, and doing your job since you were 12. I love that. Um, but I'm curious, um, I, I, I see your talk really addressing the status of classics and humanities, but also philology. And I think a couple of people have mentioned it and you just mentioned it means something different now. But I wonder if you have something to um, to say in, in this limited amount of time, it's such a big term I know, but um, it seemed like some of the efforts that you were highlighting were um, really trying to um, democratize the, the classics by removing philology. Um, and, and why is that? And um, just if you could shed a little light on that for me, it would be great. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I, I 
um, I guess another piece of my own personal story recently is having my kids in public school. Um, and so uh, I, they go to a, a, a pretty a pretty good public school that's in that's in the, our neighborhood. Um, that's what they don't go anymore, but you know when they do. Um, and I guess what worries me when I see even this pretty good public school is there's um, there's a kind of fearful sense of low expectations that attends on this world of not wanting to uh, sort of teach in an alienating way. Um, or teach topics that are going to be, as it were, like somehow too difficult to acquire. And so, you know, there's Spanish being taught something like once a week, right? I mean, it's, it's so where we're, we're, there's an attempt, I think, to kind of to keep the stuff in the mix we've always done, but not in a way that strikes me as being especially effective. Um, so I don't, um, so, so when, I, when I look at the whole picture, I, you know, I love philology, as I said, for me, it's, it's the words and the coming into understanding the language and what it was for that made me a classicist. And I think that there will continue to be the teaching of Latin and Greek in some circumstances. Um, and even at, you know, at the school, there's an after school Latin program. Um, you know, so there are ways that these things are going to go forward. But if we really want the field to be more diverse, and I think we need the field to be more diverse, not just for kind of ethical reasons, which also exist, but because we, you know, we'll die out. I mean, we need this field to be meaningful to more people, um, more people of different backgrounds. I think that to get there, um, the more pragmatic path is something like what, you know, Edith Hall and others are trying to do in the UK, which is to, to bring culture and stories and, and literature, you know, to bring them into the way we talk about classics much more and the way we promote education at the public school level um, around the country. You know, it's incredibly decentralized, so it's hard to think about how these things change here. We're much bigger than the UK. Um, but I, I, so as, I mean, as Jeff said, we have to fight on all fronts. I would never want to get rid of philology, but um, I would be very happy to make a push, see other ways of teaching classical material at the grade school level, because if we're going to change the field, we have to, we cannot start at like when we're at a search committee hiring somebody, right? We have to start with the little kids um, who are being educated and don't yet have a path. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's my view. I'll say if I, one more little comment, I, there's, a, there's a little organization in my neighborhood called Metro Squash. Um, it teaches squash, the game, to, uh, to, to essentially like, um, econ people of economically um, low status, that are poor people, poor children, because the idea is that squash is a gateway, is a sort of entry point to high society and to fellowships to college and so on. And so it just sort of offers, kind of decontextualized, offers squash. And I think, you know, it's an interesting idea. You know, it's a sort of innovative way to think about how we move through the world and like what, what kind of gifts we could we could start sharing out more broadly. I think in some ways, classics is a little bit like squash. Um, we could try to share it more broadly in that way. Um. Thank you. Monty, you have some comments. And Monty is my predecessor as the director of the program of classical studies and has been very generous to me and a wonderful teacher here. Monty, would you like to uh, uh, respond? Well, well um, sure. First of all, thank you very much for the talk, which I found um, inspiring and for your um, service to the field and the profession. I, I feel terrible because the only direct interaction we've had is me passing up a referee I request know. made to me. So uh, I, I've got to make that <laughs> up somehow. But th thank you for that work on classical philology. And, and I may have wanted to launch into a defense of the term um, philology. But instead of doing that, I'll just say, you know, one, one thing is that the teaching of Greek and Latin affects so many other fields, and it's it seems different than other languages in that for law and science and, um, uh, you know, medicine and these other areas, there's still an importance of sort of learning this language and especially of, of, of the history of it. And so, for example, in, in philosophy, we need people to be able to read Greek and Latin. Whatever, whatever classics means or whatever, they need to be able to read the works in which philosophy originated in these languages. So I was just, maybe you could comment on how 
I mean, you know, classics isn't just defending itself. If, 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 if classics is in trouble, then basically a bunch of other fields of humanities, but as I see it, a bunch of other parts of the university um, are in trouble. And then the other thing that I mentioned in chat was just, I was really intrigued and in, 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 about this idea of maybe we could look at this as a second secularization of, of the field. And I just didn't know what that, that meant at all. If you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that sound, to me, that sounded like a, a positive <laughs> yes. thing. Uh, well, thank, thank you. I mean, that's, uh, that's a great point. And I have often made the claim myself that, uh, yes, philosophy and all these other fields need us. Um, and I think, I mean, certainly a lot of the students we get in our classes who aren't classic students are interested in philosophy or are interested in studying the Bible, um, right, and, and Christianity. And, and so uh, we, so the, that is all very hopeful um, for us. If we can, if we can continue to show our sort of imprecation with other fields, then that, that's wonderful. Um, I mean, as for our, our usefulness to law and medicine, it depends, you know, on what lawyer or doctor you're talking to. Uh, I mean, my parents are, were both in law and think that my work is esoteric and weird and uh, completely detached from any world they know. Um, so, you know, that we may think that it's important, but we have to, we have to keep telling everybody that. So I guess that's part of what we have to do in general. Now, I'm going to have to like um, fail out on you on the secularization question, because that's an, I was quoting from one of these articles, but what I can do is, is send you the article, um, because I think if I try to describe it, I'm going to do it an injustice. Um, but it, yeah, no, those, um, there was a particular issue in the Chronicle Review on different ways of thinking of the humanities, and they're really actually quite illuminating pieces. Um, and so I'll, if you, if you like, I could simply um, forward that on to you. Um, thank you. Thank you. I am going to exercise my, um, my absolute authority here as the moderator, and I am going to ask a question. Zantippi has her hand up too, but I do want to ask this question, and that is, um, as many of us know, when we encounter the classical world, we encounter it through iconic sculpture. And we think of the classical world as a world of beautiful white polished marble. And as scholars have revealed, much of what we think of as classical sculpture was in fact polychromed. Um, it was a world of brilliant color to go back in both the literal and the Gatesian metaphorical sense. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what we might call the whitewashing of the classical world through this belief that um, it is a world of uh, both literal and figuratively highly polished marble, if you see what I'm getting at, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that the fact that that happened, I mean, both in regard quite literally to sculpture, but just about probably every other walk of life is, I mean, is being increasingly well documented and is, I think, really valuable to bring out. I mean, partly for political reasons, but then also just to, to show that this is like a living, breathing people that we're studying, right? And um, the noise and the politics and the color of it is exactly what keeps it alive for us. I think like it's the work of our generation of scholarship to uncover that ever more fully. Um, and, you know, it's exciting that we in a way have that job to do. Um, it's only because our, you know, our forefathers were such racists that, that they left all this work for us to do to show that our value comes not from this like presumed idea of whiteness, but from, from the inverse of that. Um, Thank you. Zantippi, your hand is up again. Yes, I just want to make a comment uh, um, that uh, I think humanity, the humanities need to present themselves to the public. I think uh, the public is what affects the state of the humanities. It's not the universities can follow of what is happening in the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, as a way, there may be a series of lectures. Now we have the internet, the videos, all this that uh, uh, can be available to larger audiences, to high schools, where you can present even for the, from the classics, the ideas that are relevant to today's problems. Now, democracy is at stake. There are, you know, very fundamental things that uh, require critical thinking. And we can bring from the classics where they are relevant, not to be dismissed, but, uh, uh, you know, what I can think, the Persians of Aeschylus, the, um, 
you know, Antigone uh, uh, kind of Priamus begging for uh, the body of his son. Yeah. All of these things can be across races. I mean, they, they, it has to defend itself that it is, you know, true humanities, that it's not, that can be of relevance to everybody. So I think people, uh, because they don't know enough, they dismiss it as being against them, but it is not against them, it is, you know, for the benefit of all of the humanity, independent of race. So in essence, I mean, we are taking, we are becoming defensive in the humanities as if we are doing something wrong. And so we should even dismiss ourselves, our existence. Thank you. That's how I feel. And I think also in the sciences, the same thing is going in another way. Everything utilitarian is not really promoting deep thinking or uh, um, this type of thing, critical thinking, I would say. So thank you very much for the time and for having me in this uh, lecture. I really appreciate that. I, I will just say briefly that I take some comfort in the fact that our new president's wife is a professor of English. Uh, I'd like to think that if, if at any moment now, even though they're very busy at the moment, uh, there might be some kind of turn of funding and attention toward the humanities and towards what education has to offer. Um, even in his acceptance speech, Biden uh, quoted from a Langston Hughes poem. I don't think it was really noticed because he didn't highlight it, but you know, he's, he's you know, just one person who's president, but I think that when you have some appreciation at all levels of the humanities, when you have some more hope um, of having these kinds of public forums and recognition of what, what kind of deep thinking we could help promote. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, I'm afraid I, we are running out of time. I know you have things to do. You've been very generous with us, giving us almost a full hour and a half. And I want to thank everyone who's been part of this. And let me just conclude again by thanking Anna Marie, thanking everyone who has been involved in, in setting this up, thanking our Hellenic Studies community. Many of its members uh, have uh, Zoomed in with us, our undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty. I can think of no better way of initiating our conversation for the rest of this year on the place of the classics, the relationship between the ancient and the modern world, and the challenges that we have as teachers and as, as public intellectuals and as, uh, as general members of the public. So I hope all of you will join me in giving a virtual hand to Sarah Nutter, thanking her again, and thank all of you for these remarkable uh, engagements and your thoughtfulness. It was a wonderful program. I thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> I'm really glad we were part of this. Thank you all.